But uh, yeah, hey, everybody. Um, thanks for coming to another round of quantum computing meetup and discussion. Today, we have, you know, one of our regulars, Anna Naden, back at uh, talk again, um, just speaking about Shor's algorithm. Um, I'm sure you've already heard of Anna's background at this point. Um, but uh, just in case we need to go back there, uh, she did receive her master's degree in physics at the University of California, Davis, um, and actually got her MD at the, I don't know how to pronounce it, but um, yeah, she got her MD as well. Um, currently, right now, she is a physicist educator at the Applied Quantum Physics Corporation. Um, and also providing a lot of educational support on quantum computing on her website. Make sure to check that out after the meetup. And um, yeah, well, ladies and gentlemen, Anna Nader. Thank you, Ilya. Uh, so this is about Shor's algorithm. And uh, I'm going to start off. Shor's algorithm promises to break public key encryption when the quantum computers are available. And uh, public key encryption is used in the entire uh, uh, certificate authority infrastructure. It's used in email. It's used in online credit card transactions, and it's used by the government. Uh, it's not used for bulk encryption of large amounts of data. What it's used for is transmitting the, the encryption key, the symmetric encryption key that is used. So if it's compromised, uh, the game is up. And, and so what people are doing, I'm quite sure they're doing it, is they're um, recording the encrypted trans transmissions now. And uh, then when the computers become available, they'll be able to read it. So Peter Shore, Peter and Jennifer Shore, perhaps his daughter or his wife, wrote this poem. If the computers you build are quantum, then spies everywhere will want them. Our codes will all fail and they'll read our email till we get crypto that's quantum and dantum. I'm gonna paste, I, I talked about the importance of Shor's algorithm. Uh, the thing is, public key encryption is based on uh, factoring products of prime numbers. And uh, that can be done with the classical computer. It just takes a million years for the large numbers that are used. And that's why uh, nobody's proved it, but that's why it's believed that the RSA encryption scheme is secure, uh, at least in the pre-quantum era. era. Uh, so the difference between uh, quantum factoring and, and factoring on a classical computer is one of what's called computational complexity. Complexity theory is based on Turing machines, and the church Turing thesis is all computing devices can be simulated by a Turing machine. Well, that was true until we got quantum. Another formulation, any physical quantum computing device can be simulated by a Turing machine in a number of steps, polynomial in the resources used by the computing device. So what that says is if you take the number of digits in the uh, 
integer that's part of the public key, then it would, if you could do it in polynomial time, then the number of steps, the number of instruction cycles would be a polynomial, like a square or a cube of the number of uh, digits, proportional. Uh, that's not the case for classical computers. It's only the case for quantum computers, that Shor's algorithm. So complexity is a, a measure of the amount of computing resources that a particular algorithm consumes when it runs. So let's take the example of sorting through a list, a list with n elements, searching through a list of n elements. Well, the naive strategy is to just look at them one at a time. So on the average, you'd have to go halfway through the list. So what what they say is the complexity of uh, searching an unordered list is n. Now, if you sort the list, you can use binary search where you can jump around and uh, do it much faster. The complexity is log n, which is a function that increases much more slowly. As I've been saying, uh, Breaking uh, public key encryption is exponential in the amount of time. Of course, exponential is like uh, 110, <laughs> 110, 100, 1,000, 10,000. It grows very fast. Um, and on a quantum computer, it's polynomial time. And that's where the division is made between what's considered practical and what's considered impractical. So uh, there's a lot of math in this topic, and we're going to have to look at it. Um, the first topic is prime numbers. The prime number is uh, well, it's kind of a generalization of odd numbers. Odd numbers can't be divided by two. Prime numbers can't be divided by two or three or five or seven. They can't be divided by anything. So I've listed out the first uh, six prime numbers, two, three, five, seven, 11, and 13. And the fundamental theorem of arithmetic is that any integer can be expressed as a product of powers of primes. So I've shown 84 here, it's two squared times three times seven. The numbers we're dealing with, with public key encryption are products of only two primes, a pair of primes. And the name of the game is to find those primes. Now, if you find one, you can, by dividing, you can get the other one immediately. So the, the key concept in uh, public key encryption is, is the greatest common divisor. I've shown here an algorithm for computing the greatest common divisor. Uh, so take four and six. The divisors of four are one, two, and four. Well, four doesn't count because it's that's the whole number. So the divisors are one and two. The divisors of six are two and three. So what do they have in common? The common divisor is two. Similarly, the greatest common divisor of 10 and 15, 10 is divisible by five and so is 15. And so the common divisor is five. Now, what we're mainly interested in, in is pairs of numbers that are relatively prime. That is, they have no divisor in common. And I've given you an example here, seven and 11. The only number that goes evenly into seven and 11 is one. 
So these are the complexities, the numbers of steps required to factor a semi-prime integer. A semi-prime integer, these are the ones we're concerned with. They're the products of two primes. So the best known classical algorithm is called the general number field sieve. And uh, it's a little hard to see, but n is the size of the integer. So log n is, is proportional to the number of digits. So the amount of work that you have to do is exponential in the number of digits. But with a quantum computer, it's more like the square of the number of digits, and that makes it practical. Of course, you need thousands of qubits, which we don't have. So I've given you the key example that we're going to look at today, 15. It's a product of 3 and 5. So these are our secrets, 3 and 5 are our secrets. Now, it's easy to look at 15 and know that it's three times five, but we're talking about numbers that are hundreds or thousands of digits long, and it's almost impossible to get the prime number, the prime factors. So here's a flow chart of, of Thor's algorithm. This is what you get from the public key a semi-prime number. In our example, it's 15. You pick an integer at random that has no divisors in common with the public key. In other words, a co-prime integer. And the example we're going to deal with today is 7. Um, you find the period, and I'll explain what that means, but we're going to get 4. And from the period, you get the factors, 3 and 5. Now, sometimes you won't get 3 and 5. You'll get 1 and 15, for example. And that's not useful. That's not the answer. So this is not really a deterministic process. You're not guaranteed to get the right answer. But you'll know if you get the wrong answer, and you just repeat the computation a second time, and you'll probably get you'll probably succeed that time. Um, the foundation for what I'm giving you today is from IBM's uh, wonderful textbook, online textbook, the Kiskit textbook. And I've pasted a link in the chat. So uh, to kick off Chor's algorithm, you have to have a, a co-prime integer an integer that uh, doesn't have any factors in common with the public key. So if the in the example we're doing, the public key is 15, and the co-prime integers are 2, 4, 7, 8, 11, and 13. 3, and, 3, 5, 6, 9, 10, and 12 are not, because they're multiples of either 3 or 5. So. It's all based on modular arithmetic. Modular arithmetic is where you, you do the computation, you divide by the modulus, you divide by a number, which is a reference number, which is called the modulus, and you look at the remainder. And the remainder is what tells you whether it's equal or not. Um, Shor's algorithm is based on finding periods so what I've got here it says e to the x mod 35 that should be 3 to the x mod 35 x is an integer and as you can see if you look closely this curve repeats. If you go from 0 to 12, it starts over. So 12 is the period. Here's the code that generated this figure. So this shows what the modulus is. 
you just keep subtracting the modulus until it's less than the number you uh, until until it's less than the number you started with, and that generated this figure. Um, so it's very important to understand what I'm talking about as far as the period of a function. Um, yeah, I, I guess I could hop in there. So the period is just the remainder after you just divide it by a number? No, the mod, the, the uh, result is the remainder. The period is like three to the zero is one. Three right. to the 12 is also one. So the period is 12. Um, so let me work an example. Uh, um, say X is three, three cubed is 27. Well, the remainder is also 27. Let's take X equal to four. Then, uh, Three to the x is 81. If you divide that by 35, you get two with the remainder 11. And you can see right here, that's the answer. Three to the x mod 35, or um, three to the fourth power mod 35 is 11. So I have a question here. So I'm looking into the Kiskid textbook and it's saying AR mod N is equal to one. So A is a co-prime number that we're determining here and it's a co-prime number less than N. And it, and it is, but in this we didn't case, determine it. We, we just picked it at random. So the value three in this case can be any random number. As long as it's that co is co prime to n. But okay, we co prime use, to 35. Yeah, we couldn't use five, for example, or seven. Okay. And if this number three, for example, uh, does not fit a solution, then we would go to the next co prime number? No, we, we could uh, do it again with three, actually. It's not okay. a deterministic process. So um, these quantum states are represented by integers. And I've, I've shown here a three qubit system. So there are eight states. Um, you can think of this as three particles, three spinning electrons, three polarized photons, or just three qubits in a quantum computer three transmons or trapped ions. Anyway, uh, we're gonna be representing, we're not gonna use the representation on the left here, this one. We're gonna use the rep representation on the right. And if you look at this, you can see it's binary encoding. It's zero, one, zero, well, that's binary for two. Zero, one, one is binary for three. So these are the states that we use in the quantum Fourier transform. Uh, one point that was raised uh, in a previous uh, seminar I gave was, uh, you think of a four classical Fourier transform as like a, a signal processing uh, process where you have a time series, things that are sampled in time. That's not what we have here. What we have is uh, the states of the multi qubit system. So here's where we get into the theory. U is a unitary operator. You can think of a unitary operator as a rotation in Hilbert space. Uh, Rotations in ordinary space preserve length. So if I take a car and I turn it upside down, that's not going to change the length of the car. Likewise, rotations in Hilbert space, unitary transformations, um, 
preserve the complex norm. It's a generalization of the of the concept of the length of a vector. It's where you take the magnitude of each component and square it and add up all the all the squares, and then you take the square root. That's the complex norm. Uh, and unitary operations preserve the complex norm. And uh, there's an inner product. It's analogous to the dot product between two vectors. And they preserve that too. So here we we dove into abstractions. But um, A is three in this example. Y is the quantum state. It's the right hand column here, zero through seven, if there were three qubits. In, in the example we're going to do, there are more than three. And so if you multiply times three and then take the remainder, that's what the modulus does. Well, three times one is three, three squared times one is nine, three cubed times one is 27. Um, I think my word for it, three to the 11th power leaves a remainder of 12. Three to the 12th power gets you back to one. So it's periodic, it repeats. And the way Shor's algorithm works is it finds the period uh, of the unitary transformation. Now, I promised you that this runs in polynomial time, that it doesn't take an exponential number of steps. Um, can anybody look at this slide and see why I've uh, kind of violated that requirement? Well, it's because I have powers. So you might have uh, well, I'll illustrate it in a moment. But you have to say you wanted to take seven to the power of 560 modulo 561. You'd have to square multiply seven 560 times. Well, that's too large. That's inefficient. So there's a shortcut. I've given the pseudo code here. I'm not gonna walk through it because I haven't mastered it. But uh, as you can see, rather than 560 steps, you have only 10. So that's a key part of Shor's algorithm. And this is uh, done on a classic computer. So this is, uh, the the first implementations of Shor's algorithm are, are going to be hybrid, where the Fourier transform and the period finding is done on a quantum computer, and the rest of the computation is done on a classical machine. Um, I'm going in a moment. I'm going to show you the quantum circuit that does this job, and the very first quantum circuits are made of gates. You can think of a gate as like a, an instruction in the instruction set of a classical computer. It's a, it's a single step that can't be divided into parts. And the first gate we're going to use is the Hadamard gate. And to explain the Hadamard gate, this is called the block sphere. It's a way of visualizing qubits. So qubit zero is at the North Pole. Qubit one is at the South Pole. But you might be on the equator as well, like here, which is X. 
what the Hadamard gate does, what all gates do is they rotate the vector in the block sphere. And the Hadamard gate rotates it about the y-axis. So it brings it down here like this, 90 degrees. So it takes zero to x. It takes one, it rotates it again about the y-axis, 90 degrees. So that brings it up here, which is minus x. The question, uh, the, Hardem, the Hadamard gate, uh, it retains the information from the uh, either ket of zero or ket of one. And so uh, from ket of zero is going to be on positive x? Yes, it takes ket of zero to the positive x. Okay. Hey, Anna, Jerry was just wondering if, if that was entanglement. It's not, because we only have one qubit. An entanglement takes two. It's like a like dancing. True. I wondered about that. Like the the Kiskit textbook that I referenced, they show multiple qubits as a set of block spheres. Now my understanding is you can't do that. Actually. You can do it if they're not entangled. And so what I concluded from this and from the fact that they use these block sphere illustrations for multiple qubits is that entanglement, as near as I can see, is not part of the story for Shor's algorithm. I hope what I'm saying is true, but that's what it seems to be the case. This is the quantum circuit that is the fundamental part of the Shor's algorithm. You have a bunch of zeros. Each, each horizontal line is one qubit, okay? We apply the Hadamard gate, and this is a controlled operation. So that if we had a zero here, then this unitary operator would, would not act the state would just pass through unchanged. If we had a one here, the unitary operator, which is uh, multiplying by a raised to a power would take effect if we had a one here. Now with the Hadamard gate, we've got a superposition of zero and one. So we actually get a combination of two scenarios, one where the gate runs and one where the gate doesn't run. So this is the circuit. U, U is the unitary operator that takes the quantum state and multiplies it by A. So, um... Rajiv had a question, Anna. How do you create and write the code for you? Um, I don't have a slide for that. It's in the textbook. It involves a number of swap gates. And this black box right here is the quantum Fourier transform. And what we're doing here is we're estimating the phase. See, every unitary operator preserves the norm. It preserves the magnitude of the vector. And what that says, if you look at the complex numbers, is that it merely applies a phase factor. And, and so the whole game for Shor's algorithm is to find that phase. And what is phase? I've illustrated phase here. I've got two waves, two sine waves. Well, Supposing we perform these measurements and we get one and zero and one, that's a seven. Uh, I'm talking in a, a three qubit space. So that'd be two times pi times seven over eight, 315 degrees. 
uh, I made an error here. I divided by 16. Should have divided by eight. Here's 157 degree phase shift. Uh, it actually should be twice this long. Here's the greatest common divisor algorithm again, because we're going to need it. So now we get to the finish line. We've got to extract the prime factors from the phase. Now, a quantum computer doesn't just give you one answer. It gives you a, a set of answers, each one with its own probability. And in this case, we got four answers, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 0, 0. So that gives you zero divided by one. The next result gives you one divided by four, then three divided by four, and one divided by two. What this is actually is two divided by four. These numbers aren't co-primed. They have the factor two in common. So if, if, we, if this is the result we got, then we'd have to repeat the computation. We wouldn't have to change any of the conditions. We just run the calculation again because quantum mechanics is probabilistic. So how do we get the factors? Well, the period is four. So that says seven to the fourth power has a remainder of one which says that seven to the fourth power minus one has a remainder of zero. That is seven to the fourth power minus one is a multiple of 15. Using uh, high school algebra, you can factor this expression into two factors. And these are what are gonna give us our answer. So the greatest common divisor of seven squared minus one with 15 is three. The greatest common divisor of seven squared plus one with 15 is five. So we got our factors and we succeeded. Uh, yeah, so this part here, this would be done, like finding the greatest common factor. This would be done in like a classical computer, right? But... The phase, Getting the phase is what's done on the quantum computer. Yeah. So once the phase is found, you just find the greatest common factor just using a regular computer. And then if they say that it's a failure, you run it on the quantum computer again to find new phases. Yep. Okay. And you just run through that multiple times until you get two prime factors, like prime numbers. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you won't have to do it very many times. Hey, Anna. Yeah. Uh, a couple slides back. Oh, we lost your slides. Um, you, you were showing the circuit for the for Shor's algorithm. Um, in the lower left corner, you had a you had the uh, ket thigh. Uh, yeah, there you go. And then uh, is that actually a quantum register that forms the an ancillary bits? Or is it, and is it the same size as the normal register or the top register? So the question is, what is psi, right? Yeah. Um... And the reason I'm asking because I've seen some of I've seen some of these explanations in, in different packages where the ancillary bit is just is, a, is another register, and uh, so I'm not sure if if that's what the notation, the exponents on the U are. Um, it's indicating that it's operating in a certain subset of that register. No, the exponents of uh, right T. Let me get my pointer. He selects which qubit you're working with. 
zero, one, two, three, and so on. I think. And what psi? I believe psi uh, comes from that random number that we chose, the co-prime number, the a, the three. Uh, yeah. Okay. So it has to be more than one qubit to hold yes. that number. Then, right? Okay. All right. Good. Thank. You. Um. So finally, these are all my slides, but I realize I haven't really shown the Fourier transform. So I'm going to bring that up. I have another PowerPoint presentation. So this is a classical Fourier transform. I've just dummied up a signal here with uh, three frequencies in it. And when I compute the Fourier transform, I get spikes according to the period of the function. Now, the way this is different from the quantum case is this is a time series. These are measurements that are performed over time. Whereas uh, with Chor's algorithm, you're dealing with multiple qubits. This is the definition of the Fourier transform. Uh, and it's the same for quantum as it is for classical. But would you ever have to apply the Fourier transform on a classical computer? No, you wouldn't. But the, the math you use to define the circuit is the same as the math that's used to derive the fast Fourier transform that's used on classical computers. The algebra is the same. That's why I'm bringing it in. Sure. So, so Professor, uh, uh, the question yeah. here is where, where is the optimization uh, performed? Is it um, in the QFT or the Shor's algorithm? Uh, I don't see optimization as really being part of the story here. I could be mistaken, but I, I'm not aware of it. Here's the quantum definition of a Fourier transform. This is a sum over all the uh, possible states of the multi-qubit system. This number here is very interesting and uh, you should uh, try to focus on this if you wanna understand the algorithm. This is a phase factor. It's a complex number whose norm, whose magnitude is one and whose phase is different for each quantum state. So um, I guess that's like the gist of it, right? Like the Fourier transfer. So um, in that graph above, you showed like what was going on with like a certain qubit over time period. And then the transform literally just takes that graph and just converts it into the number of like frequency. So the number of times something has come up multiple times during that time sequence. Uh, it's the inverse of the period, the inverse of the separation uh, that you have to have to for the sequence to repeat itself. Okay, I see. So if you do the math, you can rewrite the definition like this. And these zero dot J, these are like binary fractions. So like point 0.1 represents a half, point 0.11 represents three quarters, point zero 0.01 represents one quarter. 0 0.001 represents one eight and so on. So, so if you go through these manipulations, here's you start off with the fundamental definition of the Fourier transform and you just do the algebra. And this is what you get. And the value of this expression here at the end is that you can write a circuit, a quantum circuit.
and all this is going on in the circuit that you showed us, you know, with the block that said QFT. Yep. Yeah, that's just going on in there, right? Yep. Yeah. So here's here's the circuit, the Fourier transform circuit. So you get there's a good animation. Now I'll, I'll show it in a moment. That shows that um, you're on the equator of the block sphere. So you, you have equal parts zero and one, but with a phase shift between the two. So this is your your Fourier transform. So I guess just a follow up question is like, do you have to apply a Fourier transform to every kind of quantum algorithm or just Schwartz algorithm? There are others. Okay. Um, and that phase estimation is apparently fundamental for a large number of algorithms, but I couldn't tell you which ones. True. So that, uh, that completes the formal part of the presentation. Uh, 